Good morning and welcome to Midweek Connection from First Presbyterian Church on June 29th of 2022. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. <laughs> and this is Natalie. And uh, we're here to do what we typically do on Wednesdays, and that is to read through our lectionary texts for today and to talk about it and have a little discussion and see where God might lead, because I really do believe that uh, being in God's Word more regularly and reading passages of scripture that are sometimes unfamiliar uh, is a good way to learn more about God's character, to learn about how humans have responded to God's character, and then to learn about ways that we ourselves need to be responding to what God is uh, saying to us that we might be transformed more into the people that he would have us to be. So let me open us in a word of prayer and then we'll go ahead and get started with our reading. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the capacity that you have given us to uh, to read your word. We thank you, Lord, for giving it to us that we would be changed by it. So I pray that you would bless our time together today, and I pray in all that we say and do that you would be glorified and that we would be transformed. Uh, we thank you and we praise you. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. So our first psalm today is, and I should have this marked already, but I don't, it's Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God, of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. In Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew, Hebrew text comes today from Numbers chapter 22, starting in verse 41 and going through 23, 12. On the next day, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to Bahath Baal, and from there he could see part of the people of Israel. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build me seven altars here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. Balak did as Balaam had said, and Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stay here beside your burnt offerings while I go aside. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me. Whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went to a bare height. Then God met Balaam, and Balaam said to him, I have arranged the seven altars and have offered a bull and a ram on each altar. The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and this is what you must say. 
So he returned to Balak, who was standing beside his burnt offerings with all the officials of Moab. Then Balaam uttered his oracle, saying, Balak has brought me from Aram, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him, from the hills I behold him. Here is a people living alone and not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the dust cloud of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but now you have done nothing but bless them. Balaam answered, Must I not take care to say what the Lord puts into my mouth? And from Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 25. Did what with what is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. Our gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 33 and going to the end of the chapter. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again. He sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out to the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Psalm 125 Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, from this time on and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. 
but those who turn aside to their own crooked ways. The Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And our final psalm today is Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver, I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Uh, this numbers passage today, Natalie, is one of the reasons why I think it's important for all of us to be reading our daily lectionary texts um, as frequently as possible because this is... Uh, not even the conclusion of the story. This is kind of the middle of the story of uh, Israel wandering through the wilderness and coming up against um, actually people who were their relatives distantly in some cases, uh, but uh, neighboring kingdoms that they were walking through as they were moving from the, uh, the wilderness towards the promised land. And they have encountered various people groups along the way and have asked, if they can go uh, go through their land without taking any of their water, without taking any of their uh, of their produce and things like that, just let us move through to where God has directed us. And almost inevitably, each one of these groups uh, confronts them and gets into an argument with them. And sometimes they fight and things of that nature. But in this one particular instance, this guy named Balak has hired a prophet, Balaam, to come and curse the Israelites because he has seen that the Lord is with them, so he wants to curse them so that they can fight against them. And this passage that we read today is the one that immediately follows where Balaam had taken his hire, he is riding his donkey uh, to go meet up with, with uh, Balak, and this is where the angel of the Lord is standing in front of Balaam and is planning to kill Balaam for his uh, for his disobedience and this is where the donkey turns aside one time and the donkey pushes up against the wall on the other side to try to get around the angel and at one point the angel is right in the middle of the road and the donkey does nothing but just stops in the middle of the road and and Balaam is beating on the donkey and stuff and the donkey turns and says why are you beating me I'm, there's an angel in the way and the angel's trying to kill us and then the Lord opens Balaam's eyes and you know this whole thing and so uh it's one of these fascinating stories about a donkey who talks in order to teach a prophet to say the right thing. And it's this, it's, it's uh, the irony and the humor I think is intentional, but at the same time, Balaam actually responds well and says, wow, and he repents of going to essentially curse for hire and says, well, I need to say what the Lord is telling me to say. And so they set up the altars, they make the sacrifice, God tells them to come and, 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 and pronounce this blessing upon Israel as opposed to the curse. And, and I know we've already read it before, uh, but uh, Balak asks, or Balak asks this question of Balaam, what have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but now you have not done nothing but bless them. And Balaam answers, must I not take care to say what the Lord puts into my mouth? Um, and, and again, I think this is one of these uh, fantastic stories, as in this doesn't happen regularly, right? You know, I, I've never heard a donkey do any more than, you know, hee-haw, you know. Right. I've never actually heard it say anything. Um, but here is Balaam uh, confessing 
that that's what we're supposed to be doing. We need to take care what comes out of our mouth. And to presume that one can curse something that God has blessed or in vice versa, to assume that one can bless something that God has cursed, how, how can we be more uh, obedient to what God's calling us to do? How can we better discern what it is that God would have us to do in, in any given situation? And hopefully we wouldn't ever have to be in a place where the angel of the Lord would be threatening to kill us right. for our disobedience. But, but again, I think the lesson we learn from this is how do we listen more closely to what God is saying? How can we be obedient about what comes out of our mouth? How do we bless the things that God blesses or curse the things that God curses? But ultimately, how are we obedient to what God's calling us to do? Right. And I think that plays out, you know, I don't think we're going to be riding a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns around and speaks to us. But how does that play out? in our lives and how does that play out in our reality and I think you you look at social media and you look at what the world is telling us and you look at the things that um, it's so easy to when you hold a set of beliefs that the world doesn't hear are you or that the, the world doesn't uphold or the world doesn't respect they don't, the world doesn't see things through the lens of Christ. And so how do we stay true to our beliefs and speak truth and be obedient, mm. but yet be loving? Right. And in the culture that we live in right now, I think there's so much hatred, mm -hmm. so much hatred. And speaking truth is not, um, not always looked upon. <laughs> in good light right and but yet how do we say obedient yeah. and God, like, god's truth right god's because truth. everybody's right. got Everybody. their own definition Absolutely. of what is true and there's right. so many different there's you know there's so many things right now that are right. such hot button issues how do we stay obedient to what god calls us mm -hmm. to do and to believe but yet at the same time how do you speak truth and still love right how and do you speak truth and still I, love think that we're having a hard time with that as a society, as a world. I think yeah. that there's a lot of people not. Well, and I think uh, I think Paul addresses some of that conflict in his uh, his famous discourse in Romans seven, where he talks about he wants to do things um, in the spirit, but he's at war essentially against his flesh, and how there are those two uh, conflicting uh, that tension within himself. Now, uh, I know that theologians have debated uh, Romans 7 for a long time about what exactly is Paul referring to. Is this Paul pre-conversion? Is this Paul post-conversion? Is this uh, an, an immature Christian waiting to become a mature Christian? And I think actually um, probably the best uh, uh, understanding that I could have of it is it's, it's, it's the conflict that goes within, within every believer um, probably ultimately until we are fully in the presence of God uh, when we have been fully redeemed into, uh, into his presence uh, you know, either upon our death or when he comes again but this idea of we know in our spirit often what we're supposed to do but there's still this conflict within the flesh uh, and the two don't always line up and, um, and I think what uh, if, if you look back at the Romans, uh, sorry, the Matthew 22 passage with the wicked tenets, um, it's explicitly clear at the end of the chapter that Jesus was telling this parable against the chief priests and the Pharisees. These were the people that knew God's law. These were the people that practiced God's law. To the letter of to the, the, law, letter to of the, the law. letter of the law. These are why, the people... Why there was no... These were the people that had dedicated their entire lives to following after God's law, uh, but but they missed something. They, they loved the law so much mm -hmm. that they didn't even see the fulfillment of it in Christ. Right, right. They yeah. couldn't see. Right. And this is a terribly troubling parable that God had... Uh, 
God had created a place for these people to be participating uh, in that good work. You know, they were tenants in the vineyard uh, that God had provided for them. Um, and uh, that, that wrestling with the inheritance issue is just, why in the world would a tenant ever think that they could kill the son and get the inheritance? That's just not how it works. It doesn't work in their society that way. It doesn't work in our society that way. It's like you kill the, you kill the, the heir, uh, the tenant's not going to go, oh, okay, well, then you get it. You know, he's going to come in judgment. And, uh, and so that, that whole idea of, um, again, how, how do we listen more closely to what God is calling us to do? How are we being better participants, tenants in God's vineyard to bring the fruit of, the produce the harvest that needs to be produced? Uh, the, the fruit of the fruits of the kingdom as, as Jesus uh, describes it. Uh, you know, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from people who are disobedient and will be given to those that produce the fruits. And, and I think this is where Paul's uh, prayer of adoration at the end of that Romans 7 passage, uh, you know, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That really our capacity to do anything good is fully dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Challenging passages. Right. I think as they always are. <laughs> you right. know, it's like, yes, right. well, right. Right. And as you look at the end of that Matthew passage that you read, um, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes, you, you know, you've got the fulfillment of the law standing right in front of them. And rather than recognizing that, it just, they're so angry. And they, I mean, enraged them. They want to kill him. Right. And yet they don't because they're afraid of what the crowds will do. Mm -hmm. And so they're more afraid of what these people will do than what God will do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, That's interesting. Well, I wonder how frequently we either say things that people want to hear or refrain from saying things that they should hear because we're worried about what their response might be. And, and in this case, it's, you know, the crowd, they loved who Jesus was and they, and they you know, but on the flip side, those of us who do love Jesus, I wonder if we sometimes struggle with that same, the same issue that we can be too concerned with too concerned with the crowds as opposed to being obedient. You know, like, you know, again, Balaam was obedient to God, even though the guy who hired him <laughs> to curse, right. he's just like, I, I, yeah. No, like, well, and yes, he's facing death by the angel, but when he goes and proclaims this, I mean, this is a guy that's intent on killing God's people. Right. What's going to stop him from killing him? Right, I mean, right. He, just the throwing himself out there, right? Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, yeah, following following Jesus is the best thing that we can possibly do, but that certainly doesn't make it easy. No. Certainly will lead to potential problems and conflicts. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where you know we can we can close it again. The final psalm we read was that Psalm 91 about how, uh, again, those who live in the shelter of the Most High uh, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my strength, uh, my God in whom I trust. It's, um, he ultimately is the one who delivers. And, and again, not, not only in a physical capacity, but the spiritual capacity. Um, uh, you know, we all, we all know that none of us make it out of here alive. Every one of us is on some path towards our own uh, physical death. And the question is, uh, are, is Psalm 91 true? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is true here and now. 
it is true at the end of times. Uh, those who trust fully in God um, are going to be uh, are going to be delivered by Him. And I think in Jesus Christ we experience so much of that here and now, uh, but it's even just a glimpse of of what eternity is going to be. Um, and so, yeah, I have good words today. Yeah, yeah. thanks for joining me today. Uh, do you want to close this in prayer? Absolutely. Great. Gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for this opportunity for us to spend together in sharing um, your word and uh, thoughts on that. And I pray that you give us ears to hear and hearts to listen um, to the words that you do have for us and the things that you are calling us to do so that we may be obedient to you. And I pray that even when that obedience is difficult, that we feel your hand in that and, and in those interactions with people around us. And as we go into the world, that, that we can shine the light on you and that we can glorify you in the things we say and the things we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us again today. And I certainly hope that if you are unable to be present with us in our worship services at 1030 on Sunday mornings, tune in and uh, watch online or, or watch later as it gets posted. Uh, but if you do have questions or comments or concerns, please don't hesitate to call up to the church and we can certainly listen to those and, and, uh, and pray with you. But um, I'm grateful uh, for you all. I'm grateful for your prayers. I know that uh, many of you are praying for us. And uh, thank you, Natalie, for participating today. And we will look forward to seeing you the next time. Have a good day. Bye-bye.